now yep. I'm pushing record. There we go. So we're all recorded. Um, oh, hi, everyone. Uh, again, like I say, I promise whatever we got to do next year, we'll, we got to wear full Tyvek and respirators. We'll do that. But this is, it's, it's time for us to actually meet each other. But I, I, I think we're heading in a different direction here. So uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, let me start my share here real quick and share this one. Go over some of what we're covering here. Uh, All right, um, so a few, I think, housekeeping items to take note of. Um, first thing is this is not set up like a webinar. So I figured it was a small enough group. We kind of know each other. Um, a webinar is a little bit different. It's a, it's a one-way directional uh, meeting here. Everyone has the opportunity to uh, unmute and, and uh, chime in if you want. Um, so with that said, stay muted if you uh, just just to make things uh, easier and, and um, uh, you know, minimize feedback and chatter. Um, I don't care if you have your cameras on or off. I know that we've been thankfully I haven't done much teaching online. I'm still teaching one of my classes with a both my classes with an online option. But I, I talk to my students, but I know it can be uh, a little nuts to be kind of talking to a, to a blank screen. But it's up to you. You also don't necessarily need us in your living room. Um, this meeting is largely procedural for the Tree Fur Growers Association, uh, and I've been highlighting, if you, you know, been getting emails from me, um, this is the VTFGA meeting, you're getting the UVM update, um, but it's not like the old meeting where we had the speakers from all around uh, that bring the information that makes it count for pesticide credits. So no pesticides credits covered for this meeting, I will talk about how to get recertification credits uh, moving ahead. I've made a couple of you, I think Eric and Sarah Kingsley Richards, I've made you both co-hosts. Um, if you wanna keep an eye on the chat, I have it open in another window as well, um, but that's gonna be a good spot if folks have questions coming along. <clears throat> or I don't, I, I'm not sure how many we have, it was 17 or 18 or maybe 20 by now, 20 some, um, small enough that if, you know, if there's a gap in conversation, just unmute and, and ask a question if you need to. Um, Okay, so I think that sort of covers the, the ground rules of things. And I don't have my clicker, but that's all right. I'm at my keyboard anyway. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about where sort of our, our shop is right now in, in 2022. There's been a, a few changes, um, most of which happened interestingly during the pandemic uh, timing wise. Um, I do want to highlight the opportunity for credits for those of you who want credits. This is sort of our main area that, that we're focusing on this winter, which is the Northeast Extension Fruit Consortium Winter Webinar Series. Uh, we're about halfway through this now. I sent out a message a while back uh, and I'll, I'll uh, highlight in a second here. I'm also taking notes of uh, links to send out to you folks. So if anyone's got any questions and, and has something in a follow-up email you wanna see, I'll certainly uh, add that in. I don't see, uh, us going back from some version of this for for the for for as far as I see moving forward, this has been a pretty successful series. Started last year, um, this is the second year we did it, and it really kind of came about because we realized it would be foolish for UMass to have an all-day uh, meeting and UConn to have an all-day meeting, and all of us to have the same speakers all on Zoom. And we said, why don't we just spread this out throughout the season and host them all. Um, together, uh, you know, knowing how to thin Honeycrisp is the same in, in Connecticut as it is in Vermont. Uh, and it also allows us to bring people in from elsewhere. So that's sort of where we're heading. Um, most of these, actually all of these um, that are moving ahead have all got an opportunity for uh, pesticide credits. Sarah Kinsley Richards will be jumping on uh, in a little bit and um, she'll also be talking about another uh, avenue to get a good chunk of credits. Uh, and she'll also be showing you how to find your credits because uh, things have gotten a little bit um, uh, hard to find sometimes. So these are the four webinars that are that are left. They're all accessible through the same registration screen. I will send that um, out to the group. They're also being recorded and they're all being held. Right now they're on the, the UMass Extension Fruit Team YouTube sites. What I will do is as I did last year is when they're all done, I make a separate playlist. I don't move the files over or anything, but I make a playlist on the UVM uh, YouTube site, which is in my signature and everything that I, I, every email I send out. Um, 
and so they're just all in one place. So you can you can look back and see, you know, last week we were talking about crop load management in, in Honeycrisp, and there's been some other um, um, pretty interesting ones that have come up in the last few weeks. Um, this was around last summer uh, or last year. This I, I just reused this slide from last year. Um, you know, this is the first season we've kind of gone through UVM uh, overall, all the way up to the top, changed their web platform on us. We knew it was coming for a while, um, but there was a, a literally one month back in, I think it was November of 2021, um, 2020, November of 2020, um, when they said, your website's about to disappear, uh, move it over now. And uh, we kind of hastily moved this over. This was myself, um, actually anybody in Extension who had one of the old sites, um, our site was combined with Vern Grubinger's uh, vegetable and berry uh, site. And when we kind of moved things over there, there's some definitely some, some pieces that didn't pull over very well. If you find uh, moving, uh, when you go to this site and it's, it's an easier site to find, it's, uh, the, the, the link is here and it's now in, in my uh, web address and all the old sites uh, redirect over here dead links, anything like that. I did submit a uh, letter of intent for a fairly modest uh, specialty crop grant to hire someone to go through line by line and kind of recode this thing. But certainly those of you who are the users, um, I would be interested in, in any input you have uh, on cleaning up this site. And other also uh, just real information that you'd like to see um, added in there, if it makes sense. Everything old is new again. Um, we are still updating the New England Tree Fruit Management Guide. It's entirely online like it has been for the last few years. Um, we do not have this year's updates yet, but I know um, Heather Fobert, uh, URI is kind of one of the main people and Mary Conklin who's retiring, but thankfully still around um, are I'd say the two main drivers um, working to update uh, the spray tables to get make sure that, that the latest uh, pesticide information exists. Um, so this is this should be kind of your primary point. This is uh, phone enabled, so um, it's it's relatively usable on a phone. Um, it is not the same as the old guide with you know all the biology pages and all that stuff in there um, that just didn't carry over. But this is this is the spot that uh, you should go to when you've got questions about particularly spray table, uh, uh, you know the spray tables. Oh, yeah. Uh, NIWA. So NIWA is uh, still happening. This will be the first year that what we call NIWA 3.0. Um, I think everybody in this call is familiar with this, but I'll recap it uh, for maybe the couple that aren't. Um, this is the real-time uh, weather system that's used to drive integrated pest management models on farms throughout really all of the eastern U.S. Uh, and even a little bit of the west. It's gotten to be quite a um, a large and well-used product. Um, this new design last year was kind of a, a, an odd year because it wasn't fully ready uh, when the growing season started. And so they had to use both the new and the old system uh, because some of the new models or some of the models hadn't been pulled over. This is it now, you can't access the old system. And uh, this was a, a um, critical tool for all of us, it allows us to, um, you know, really get a sense for what's happening and to plan our sprays and plan our just general crop management. Um, but if there's issues, uh, let usually probably me know uh, or Dan Olmstead. There's uh, there's a there, there's a link on here, which of course I didn't. This is just a screen cap um, that you can send feedback uh, on it uh, because there 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 will likely be hiccups. I think they're ironing many of them out, um, and uh, yeah, we'll be interested in. Um, anybody to help out uh, with ironing those out. All right, so talking about this past year, um, if I wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be me giving a talk if I didn't give one of these really confusing kind of ugly charts of the weather uh, back in, in spring of 2021. The main thing I wanted to highlight here um, was a couple things. Last year, we didn't have much scab. This is the number of scab infection periods. Uh, that we had during the, the primary scab season. It was just you know, five infection periods, none very serious. And so I'm not really expecting to see a whole lot of scab carrying over in managed orchards. The other key thing that we're looking at here is this line. This is the epiphytic infection potential for fire blight. And when it hits 100, you've got high fire blight risk. 
and you can see at one spot at one point it actually went right off the charts. Most of our growers are getting used to managing fire blights. Um, it's not what it was when I started in this business, which was a, a curiosity that you would see on farms, but it's something that we really need to be ready to manage every single year. Um, we may not get it, but we've got to pay attention to it. Um, so I do recommend being ready to have uh, copper on hand at Green Tip whenever that comes. Thankfully, it doesn't seem like it's going to be anytime too soon, but it is March 1st and I've sprayed in March before. So um, be ready to, to uh, treat the whole orchards with copper um, and uh, be ready to potentially treat with streptomycin. I usually like to have one, one shot of streptomycin on hand um, going into the seasoning because you never know what's going to happen. Um, that's kind of my main, my main sort of disease uh, uh, item to stay aware of. I do want to mention um, this summer, uh, well, going back to summer of 2020, um, one of the benefits of not actually teaching classes and actually running a pretty limited program um, was that I actually got to get out in the field more than I have in a decade. Um, and then uh, last summer, 2021, of course, all of our courses were back teaching and I was too busy to get out a whole lot, but um, my teaching this summer is lightened up a bit and I plan on doing a weekly field day somewhere in, in, um, uh, in Vermont. Field day meaning day for me to be out driving the fields. So if folks are interested, um, this will probably start uh, you know, mid-May, mid-late May. Mid -late May. Um, and go through the summer. Um, give me a holler if you're going to be around. I'm not sure what day of the week it'll be. Um, I'm going to try to keep it consistent, but potentially flexible based upon rain. Um, but I will be um, sending out a notice to the Apple list um, when I'm trying to schedule things so I can try to hit, um, you know, all the counties, Vermont, and any growers who want to visit. Um, wanted to highlight this piece uh, just to get on people's radar. There's a there's an effort, or I wouldn't say an effort. There's a a, a new program at the state, um, the Vermont Agriculture Innovation Board, that was formed in legislation last spring, um, and has just we just met for the first time yesterday. Uh, I say we because I was I'm I'm on the board. This is not a picture of the board. This is a picture of us on the on the uh, pollinator board, but similar um, similar advisory board. Um, that the Pollinator Protection Committee was with a little bit difference here. So um, my old boss, many of you know, Lorraine Burkett, um, she was on the, the VPAC, Vermont Pesticide Advisory Council for probably 20 years. Um, Sid Bosworth, the, the now retired agronomist was also on there for a long time. Um, Ann Hazelrig was on there. Um, this new legislation dissolved the old VPAC advisory board and replaced it with this agriculture innovation board. And the reasoning behind that was a couple of things. One is um, it, the, the legislature and the agency of ag um, find it difficult to deal with all these single issue bills that come up year by year, um, oftentimes kind of highlighting one pesticide of, uh, you know, uh, of one certain crop you know, a lot of times it's neonicotinoids, other times it has something to do with um, oftentimes corn herbicides. Uh, and so they wanted to, and in modern agriculture, pesticides aren't always the number one tool that people go to. And so there is some, uh, um, you know, looking at legislation around pesticides or rulemaking within the agency um, that could affect things like incentives for cover cropping and uh, no-till, thinking mostly about uh, um, field crops here, of course. Um, but I was asked to serve on this. I, uh, there's, there's 13 different members that, that each are supposed to serve a certain function. And as I look down, I fit about five of those functions. So I asked them yesterday who I'm, who I'm supposed to be speaking for on the board. Um, so I am a commercial grower, which I guess is the UVM farm, um, representing conventional and organic fruit and vegetable producers. So uh, my point is I'm the, the representative for this industry on this board. Um, it does not have an end date, unlike the, the pollinator committee. Uh, so it may be like Lorraine that I'm on this thing for the rest of my career, who knows. Um, but you know that you have somebody who's paying attention to uh, what's going on in the, in the legislature um, and in the, in the agency uh, and can advocate uh, for the industry. 
little bit of uh, changes at UVM. I wanted to see if Roy could come here today, but he was uh, booked up. But we have a new extension director. This time last year, this search was open. Um, Roy has been here for now uh, about 10 months. Um, he fills the role that Chuck Ross had filled beforehand. Um, so he's directly under the uh, Dean of the, of the UVM College of Agriculture and Life Science. Um, born in Jamaica, uh, he's already done a um, across the fence um, on uh, Jamaican apple harvesters, uh, the, the, the H2A workers, um, kind of an interesting, interesting piece that was done on there. Um, You'll see some more energy, I think, from within extension. Uh, and as of last year, last year was the first meeting um, that we had that I finally actually had some kind of extension role, even though you you, you don't notice the difference. Um, but there's there's some more support for uh, fruit specifically um, within extension. Just means I have a little bit less grants to write. Um, within that whole 25% responsibility, I cover multiple crops and our farmer training program. So I'm as diluted as always. Um, but uh, my the the uh, having NEWA number one allows us to um, conduct uh, extension in ways that we couldn't have done when I first started with this. And like I say, uh, I'm making a commitment to get out there and, and visit the fields uh, throughout this season. So again, if you've got any questions. Uh, or want to want to get a visit? Just let me know, and and we'll make sure to to try and hit your farm. One plug I wanted to put in um, was for the Vermont Agriculture Hall of Fame. This is something that's run um, through the Champlain Valley Exposition, uh, and I was uh, I was asked to, to be on the um, uh, not the nomination board, but the the uh, review panel for this last year. Uh, this is uh, largely historically has uh, highlighted the dairy industry. And last year, uh, there was an intentional effort made to expand this uh, to you know, agriculture more broadly. Um, Ray and Pam Allen were, uh, were uh, 2000, I forget when, six or seven uh, inducted into the, into the hall. Um, Kind of a big splash is made. UVM Extension shows up and the Agency of Ag uh, uh, presents the awards. I did want to highlight this because if we want to have anyone from uh, our industry uh, potentially uh, you know, receive this award, uh, the um, nominations are open for 10 more days. Uh, you can hop on the website. I will send that link out to the, to the group. Uh, given that I'm on the, on, the, on the review panel, I can't nominate. Uh, but this is something that uh, you know might be of interest. You can do uh, uh, posthumous awards, um, just something to think about that I think can help raise the profile a little bit of uh, the apple industry in the state. So that's what I've got as far as uh, kind of open, uh, you know, my, my my presentation. If anyone's got any quick questions, I'm happy to answer them, and then I'm eventually going to hand this over to. Um, Sarah to talk a bit about uh, the uh, uh, pesticide uh, credits in the state. Hey, Terry. It's yes, uh, Jim. Terry on that. Um, okay. oh. oh, hi, Kathleen. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I was just going to suggest uh, Russ Allen could be nominated for a lifetime award for Vermont agriculture. An important figure in the, I, uh, the apple world in Vermont. I I was go I had a picture of Russ that I dropped in there, and I said, "Well, I'm going to wait for someone else to suggest this since I'm on the review panel." But I I do think that that I highly recommend that that is someone that that would be worthy of, uh, um, yeah, being being listed in the award. Yeah, well, since I'm not Vermont, I'm going to suggest that somebody out there. <laughs> Pipe up and do it. Great. Uh, Jim? Oh, you're muted. There you go. Yes, yeah, so I, I agree that I was going to, I was thinking about Russ as well. Um, so I, I think I'll make sure that, that happens. I can nominate him or keep an eye on it in the next few days and see about that. But Terry, uh, um, that's great news that you're going to be around a little more visiting orchards. It's 
hugely important, I think, to see people like you come out and guide us uh, or suggest things. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a tiny bit more about fire blight and what you're seeing, and also about uh, crop, uh, what the crop was like, just a little more in depth about across the region, what the crop load was and this year. I'm personally still trying to get a handle on it. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I can, uh, two things. Um, why don't I do crop across the region first, uh, which is maddening to try and generalize. Um, we had everything from one of our smaller crops ever at UVM to just south of here, uh, bumper crops and trees breaking over. Um, this seems to be, within the state, we sort of have a north-south divide. It seems like in the further south you went, the, the heavier the crop was. I think, Jim, you had a relatively light crop, as I remember, uh, in, in, sort of in the Champlain Valley. And, Very light. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think those who had that light crop, you know, it's so it's so tricky to uh, try to manage, um, to try to break things back into an annual mode, especially with Honeycrisp. Um, that uh, precision crop load on Honeycrisp webinar, I'll send out a link direct to that because that's something I think people really ought to, ought to view uh, in terms of managing highly biennial crops. It's kind of a, a broader um, uh, management system than just throw carbaryl out there and, and you know decide how much NAA you want. Um, I, I wished I could give a, a, a better example, but it's something that we're going to need to really, I think, pay attention to, um, you know, orchard by orchard. One thing about the new NIWA, uh, now that everything's in one spot, is there is a pretty good um, thinning model um, in there. It's a little bit tricky to use, and as we approach bloom, I'll make sure to be sending out some messages about how to use it on your particular farm. But really what it allows you to do is to tailor um, how aggressively you want to thin based upon the weather conditions, you know, before and, and coming up. Um, so I think that's an area that that should make things a little bit easier. Um, I don't know how many folks are, are trying to uh, or are moving away from carbaryl for, for thinning. Um, if you are, that things get a little bit more tricky. Um, we're not in the situation that some states are or some people under certain uh, um, you know, management programs like Eco Apple that, that don't allow the use of carbaryl, but that's something that has made things, um, I think, relatively, the use of carbaryl keeps things, you know, relatively easier to do um, than those without. And my, my ability to make recommendations without carbaryl starts to, to, to wane a little bit. Um, that was a whole lot of a non-answer, I think, on that. But um, we're seeing, like I say, variable crop. We're seeing, um, as far as total statewide production, um, last year was, uh, I, I haven't seen the full numbers, but, but the, the, the general gist is uh, about half of a crop that we would have had 20 years ago. And a lot of, a lot of that has to do with half the acreage that we had. Um, we, we've lost a number of orchards. Um, We've, some of our old orchards are getting less productive. Uh, we see that our numbers aren't really staying competitive in terms of, of production per acre as, you know, say Massachusetts has been more, um, or certainly New York, that's been more aggressively replanting to high density systems. Um, how does that affect the industry? I mean, out of, out of this call, you know, or any, any if a general look at the, at the apple industry in Vermont, you know, you're looking at, um, a greater bifurcation of the model where you've got 20% uh, grown, 80% of the, of the fruit. Um, that's really a, a more difficult market uh, to, to play in. And it's more critical for those growers, I think, to maintain that uh, competitiveness with the higher yields in terms of, of wholesale. Um, I think that the majority of us are still retail growers and we need every apple we can get. But um, it's a whole different economy when you're when you're selling for you know a buck or two bucks on the tree, um, so I don't know. It's 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 a tricky one. Um, fire blight, you know. So we've had it so bad at the farm. I'm actually trying a a, a new project. I talked to David Rosenberger at uh, the retired pathologist at, at Cornell, and I was surprised. He thought this was a good idea. I was surprised nobody had tried it before. 
um, we're going, we've got one block that is so badly affected. And it's like just every year, it's just like a, a cancer that just keeps coming back and back, no matter how much we cut it out. Um, we are, um, we're going to top graft the orchard and try to remove all of that um, infected wood that's just been so hard to prune. Uh, so it's going to be a small research project we're trying out, but it's, it's to that point at the farm. We pulled out a lot of our cider varieties that are, that are highly susceptible. And I don't think we're that, I mean, I think, you know, the carpenter's house or the cobbler's kids, um, I don't think we're, I don't think we're that much worse than some, than some uh, uh, farms, uh, particularly that have tried more susceptible varieties. It's just one of these things we've got to pay attention to every single year. Uh, and this time of year, you know, that means cutting out every single canker we can find. And if you've got those big trees that have cankers, you know, deep into the trunks, we got to make some hard decisions on whether or not it makes sense to keep those trees or to see, you know, what part of those trees we can cut out. So, um, you know, I've been keeping strep on hand every year. Um, I've been, the last few years, I've been spraying strep every year uh, at some part because we, we hit that threshold and it's just something that, that we, we got to pay attention to. All right, well, we're approaching 12.30. So I'm, I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Sarah, uh, to go over, there was some question about how people can, can find their credits and kind of navigate the, uh, the, the, the state's um, pesticide pages. So Sarah, take it away. All right, I'm gonna try, I threw two, two links in the chat and I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Which screen do I want? That one. Is everybody seeing what looks like a website for the Pesticide Safety Education Program? Got it? Good. All right. Um, uh, I've been involved with the Apple team for many years, but one of my main roles is the Pesticide Safety Education Program at UVM. And one of the things we do is try to make things a little more clearer because sometimes the state website is not as easily navigated. And I checked, they don't have an easy way to get to this information from their website, um, which is why there's a handy link here um, to USA Plants, which is a group that, a website that the Vermont Agency of Ag works with. They maintain their databases and information on um, on credits and meetings and such like that. So I always go to my own website because I know the link's there and handy. It's the second one down on the right there. And that takes you to this website, which is a little bland, but there's all sorts of options on the side here. Um, one of which is log on. And that is, and, or register, and that's kind of going to get you a lot of information there. So you click on that and it get, asks for a username and password. And my username, and let's see if I typed it in right. Um, if you're not, if you don't have an account yet, you need to register. I believe this is the same site that we use to um, uh, re-up our credits every year. Ta-da! So it takes you to this slightly different looking site that has all of your information that they have on record for your credits. Um, and there's my address and phone number, which is where all the correspondence will come to. You also see down here, you have drop downs for payment records, employer. Like if I click on employer, it'll, sh that little plus sign, it shows me I work for the University of Vermont. That's the employer on record. Um, the exams that you've taken and then meetings attended will list out all of the meetings and the credits that you earned on record, and this is a great way to check to see um, which, if they missed something. 
Uh, there was a glitch in USA plants, I think this spring, and they had some issues with certain credits not getting logged in. Um, there's also other links up here, but this, this is a good visual of where all of your stuff is. There is another option of how to check your credits because here you just kind of add them up yourself. You can export this to Excel um, so that you can maintain your own duplicate records. Um, but I'm going to log out of this because I don't need it. Um, the Sarah, other I'm place. Gonna, I'm yeah. going to highlight something real quick because um, somebody asked with the credits for the um, winter webinar series, do we need to save these certificates uh, since you sent this to the agency of ag? And I would say it's always a good idea to just save those in case there is a glitch like that and you can go back and, and show that you had attended things. Yes. Um, the other place, if you're back on this main site um, is under pesticide programs. And even this is a little harder to follow, applicator credit and business information. So this is your information in another place you can go to look for it. Um, and here you put your certification ID number, which I think is 4330. That's my pesticide license number. And my last name is Kingsley Richards, which I was checking this the other day. If you have a registered business, you can look it up that way if you're um, a distributor or something and search. And again, this is the same information we saw on the other logon site and my information, not quite all of it, but it also tells me this little here is how many credits you need. And something got fixed because it used to say I needed 10 credits because of that glitch. And I noticed that and I contacted the state and they fixed it. Um, so this is another way you can check your credits. Um, another useful thing you can do with USA plants is again under pesticide programs, recertification course locator. If you're looking for credits, um, it takes you to this site. You can look for on site, you can look for webinars. Um, Online courses are usually online courses or things that are kind of always available online. If we do on site and then look at the date range, you can adjust that date range if you want and search. You can see my initial certification review and exam sessions that are scheduled for April. Um, if you know of anybody who's not certified yet, these are great. Um, we review the core manual material and administer the exam right there. Or if you look under webinar, um, search, um, this is where you can see a lot of the um, New England Fruit Consortium webinars that have been registered. Um, you can click on details. I don't know how many details oh, Terry's got in here. Okay, great. So the next one of those is on the eighth. One tricky part about this site is if you kind of hit the back button, it, it doesn't take you anywhere. So you kind of have to go back to the menu to get and start over if you're looking for stuff. But that I think is kind of the most useful information on USA plants. It's a convenient database. It's not the slickest looking using one, but the information's out there if you need it for finding credits. And then I am going to, oh, let's see. I'm gonna go back to my website just for, for giggles um, to point out that there is a lot of information over here in the links to some databases on labels, um, some poison control center, the spill reporting helpline hotline for the state of Vermont. Um, some useful links for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture to help you kind of navigate their site a little more and maybe get to where you need to be quicker. Also USA plants, some more direct links to the 
those areas. And I also want to point out, as I scroll down a little bit here, um, there are some training opportunities. I mentioned the initial pesticide certification meetings in April. Uh, if you're not certified yet, if you are certified, they're worth four credits. You attend in person, sit there for four hours and listen to a review of the core manual and get four credits out of it. So there is a registration fee of $30 for that for the next month. After that, it goes up to 40. So that is an option if you're looking for credits. And also the commercial pesticide applicator meeting is happening on March 28th. Let me pull up the details for that. This is free. It's going to be on Zoom. It's gonna run for four and a half, uh, yeah, four and a half hours. This is geared a little bit towards um, like field and forage commercial applicators, but don't necessarily let the name fool you. There's gonna be a lot of, I can scroll down here um, to the agenda. Um, we're going to be having Pat Hastings from Rutgers talk about PPE. And this is a more geared towards people who are a applicators who use this stuff regularly, just a kind of a refresher and some uh, reading in between the lines of the label. She's a great presenter. Uh, Mark Hudson's going to be talking about the Ag Container Recycling Program. And then we have some uh, pollinator risk presentation. So that is going to be uh, four credits if you attend the entire thing. Um, and it's going to be on Zoom on March 25th and the link is there to register for that. Um, also, if you keep scrolling down this um, PSEP page is the online courses. Uh, one of the things we do is we offer a lot of online uh, training opportunities for credit and not for credit. And if you scroll down here, you can see what we have at the moment. Um, there's a full core manual review for no credit, but it's also broken down into four segments and you can enroll in e each of these and get one credit for each one. It's a self-paced um, online course through eExtension Campus. Um, and then there's also one for talking with pollinate about protecting pollinators. Um, and then 7A manual is a structural pest manual, which we, you probably aren't interested in at all, but those folks can get credit as well too. And we're going to be putting up a um, 7F manual review soon, which is the new antimicrobial and disinfectant manual. So those are kind of cool courses. They're um, self-paced PowerPoints narrated, take a quiz, get some credits. So lots of options through the pesticide safety education program to get credits. Um, I encourage you to check it out. If you ever have a question, um, you can contact me. I'm the point person. Anna Hazelrig is the supervisor of the program. And then Annie McMillan at the State uh, Vermont Agency of Ag is your primary contact for any pesticide questions. But I am more than happy to take a stab at answering a question if you're having trouble hearing from Annie or if you think it's a simple question and don't want to bug her. I will always let you know if I don't know the answer and if Annie is the best person to talk to, but I'm happy to answer questions about pesticide use in Vermont, not recommendations for certain crops, but more about navigating the um, registration process and um, maintaining credits and that whatnot. So that's that. And I will leave you there and unshare my screen somehow. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, let's try stop share. There we go. I, uh, I went on there and I see I have four, 15 credits I need in the next couple of years. So I guess I got to sign up. I just renewed, so. Uh, I just went through the New York version and I haven't dared to get on the Vermont one to uh, see where I'm at. <laughs> Eric, do you want to take this from here in terms of yep. the next transition? Yep, I got it. Okay, so we're going to uh, switch over to our first uh, vendor spotlight here.
Steve Zapak is from Syngenta and he is uh, filling in for technically our rep who is, I believe in the Florida Keys and enjoying himself down there at the moment. But uh, uh, I'll let Steve introduce himself further. You should have screen share ability, Steve, if you'd like, and uh, I'll let you uh, take it. Okay, just let me know if you can see this uh, screen. You see my screen okay? You should be good. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Eric, and uh, thank you, the association, for having Syngenta uh, on the program today for a quick update. Uh, my name is Steve Zapak. Uh, I'm an integrated account lead with Syngenta, previously in a sales role for about 23 years. Uh, Jonathan Stevens is your sales rep. Um, and as Eric mentioned, he is soaking in a little bit of sun uh, this week. Uh, Jamie Cummings uh, also covers uh, your area. She's our uh, agronomy service representative uh, for Syngenta. So I'm going to skip into uh, my update. Um, and, and just to kind of hit on a few things, uh, the broader scope here, Syngenta has uh, a lot of solutions for apples from green tip through harvest. We've got you covered. We've got uh, fungicides, insecticides. We've got some uh, herbicides and uh, some plant activators that, that we'll talk about. Um, just off the, off the uh, start here, uh, I'm not going to spend much time on the ones that have been around for a while, like Vanguard. Vanguard has been in our portfolio for a very long time. It's a great early season, cool weather um, uh, preventative and has some curative activity, activity kickback on SCAB uh, for, for apples. Uh, we enhanced that Vanguard offering a few years ago by adding a triazole, diphenyconazole to it and, and launched Inspire Super. Uh, and then a few years ago, we launched Aprovia and then Miravis. I'm going to focus on Miravis today, uh, which is our SDHI. Uh, and then I'll also talk about Actigard and Endigo uh, and insecticide offerings and then kind of open it up for questions. Um, we all know that timing is a, a key, key point and a key issue in how things work. Uh, when we go to the beach, uh, it's important to put on your sunscreen before you go out and sunbathe. And it's a, very important to do it evenly across your body or else you'll end up with uh, splotchy, uh, spl splotchy coverage. Um, is this an issue that the sunscreen caused? No, it's more of a timing and a coverage issue. So if we do a good job getting the products on at the right time and we do a good job getting them spread out, it usually uh, helps us uh, ensure good uh, performance. Does the sunscreen fail here? No, it was uh, a timing and a coverage issue. So how do we get the, the timing right? Uh, we, we look at modeling forecasts, we scout fields, uh, we scout orchards. Uh, we try to identify problems before they become an issue. We make spraying a priority. It's important. We've got a lot of different things we do uh, on, on the farm. And if we are not doing our applications when they need to be, we will miss pests. We will miss scab infections. And when we have to go back to, when we have to go from a preventative back to a curative uh, uh, position in, in uh, scab and, and I mean, even fire blight, uh, we've lost the battle. So it's important to, to, to uh, get things positioned on a timely basis. Uh, so Miravis is our carboxamide class of chemistry or SDHI group seven fungicide. We introduced this, I believe two years after uh, we launched Aprovia. Uh, Miravis is a little uh, is a little bit better on powdery mildew than Aprovia. When we look at Miravis, it is a solo SDHI. There's nothing else in the jug other than adepidin, which is the the name of the chemistry. Uh, it is a fantastic leaf scab, fruit scab product. It's a very good uh, fly spec sooty blotch product, and it does all of that on its own without any other. Uh, pre-mixes in the jug, any other chemistries in the jug. Uh, so when you compare it against some of the other SDHI products that are on the market, those are uh, pre-mixes. They have other chemistries in the jug. So when you look at the strength of just Miravis alone, it is, uh, it is a great product. Now, when it comes to powdery mildew, powdery mildew is a, a very uh, tricky uh, disease to control. 
Uh, it too is very dependent on timing. And if we see powdery mildew on clusters um, in, in the spring, a lot of that powdery mildew infection happened the year before. So it's important to have a year long approach and a, and a programmed approach to uh, powdery mildew. So that's my plug on, uh, on, on Miravis on powdery mildew. Now the rate for Miravis is very low use rate product, 3.4 ounces to the acre. Um, Miravis is typically when we put Miravis in a program, we're going to follow um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the disease modeling uh, forecast. So if a scab infection is predicted, it's always better to have Miravis on the leaf surface as well as all your other fungicides before that scab infection occurs. Um, you typically want to follow at least a seven day schedule, or if weather permits, uh, maybe a little bit tighter schedule uh, than that. Uh, you don't want to make more than four applications of Miravis uh, per acre per season. And that goes along with uh, Aprovia as well. If you're using Aprovia and Miravis, we would want you to limit to two of each to total four for the season. Um, and, and the pre-harvest on Miravis is, uh, is 30 days. When we look at uh, the, the, the chart, the data on the left, this is disease infection. Um, so the big bars mean there's a lot of disease. The smaller bars means there's very little disease. Uh, and if you look on the left, this is Macintosh in Michigan. Um, and this is uh, a, a applied at 25% bloom and petal fall, and then the evaluations taken afterwards. So the point here I wanna make on the left side is Miravis is again, a solo SDHI and it's performing better than an SDHI premixed with uh, another chemistry. Looking a little closer to home on the, on the test to the right, the set of bars on the right showing scab incidents on Empire. Um, this is percent uh, disease control. So the higher the bars, the better the control. Uh, Miravis on the left is showing 94% fruit, uh, fruit infection control. Uh, and then again, the other premix products are showing a little bit less control. Again, I want to highlight here that Miravis as a solo SDHI product is a very strong performer uh, in and of itself. Uh, switching over to fire blight. Now, fire blight is a very big deal in apples. Uh, we know that at one point, strep was a, a, the most effective tool we had in our toolbox. We're now seeing resistance. Fire blight requires a program appro approach. Uh, timing is very specific, and you've got a very narrow window for fire blight control. And the thing with high density plantings is you are more vulnerable to high density plantings because. Fire blight's not just taking a limb out, it's taking out an entire tree. And it's difficult to always guarantee uh, that your nursery stock coming in for new plantings is clean. Uh, and some of the control failures, you don't know that you miss fire blight until weeks later. So those symptoms take a long time to develop. So I'd like to talk a little bit about is ActiGuard. ActiGuard is our uh, SAR, Systemic Activated Resistance basically a product that triggers a natural immunity within the tree. Um, it is a product that you would want to tank mix with antibiotics. It is not an antibiotic replacement. Uh, it's like taking vitamins. You always take vitamins to be well. And then when you get sick, you plug in uh, medicines to, to cover up that sickness. Um, ActiGuard helps those uh, antibiotics work better uh, and in, in, improves efficacy. Um, want to show you, just focus in on the bar on the right, uh, the, the chart on the right. This is a, a percent uh, blossom blight and percent shoot blight. You can see uh, on, on the left, the untreated, you can see a lot of uh, blossom blight infections. And so this is a block of apples that had a lot of pressure in it. Uh, Kasumin is Kasugamycin. It is that next step above uh, strep. Fire line is strep, so you can see the newer antibiotics uh, work very well, but they're very expensive. If we want to breathe a little bit more life into those older antibiotics like strep, ActiGuard, I uh, want to focus on this uh, third set of fourth set of bars here, ActiGuard plus fire line. In this set of data points, this is a tank mix of ActiGuard and strep. 
and it is significantly reducing the amount of fire blight uh, when you're using a strep product. The last set of bars is an alternation. It's not quite as good as a tank mix. So that's why we focus on recommending tank mixes with ActiGuard. So for suppression of, uh, of, of leaf blight, uh, you wanna look at an application rate of one to two ounces for, per acre. Um, and on the label, it says for best results, you wanna tank mix with an antibiotic uh, product. Now, our recommendation for the Northeast would be to time it uh, starting at pink. So if you think about um, triggering a plant's immune response, you wanna trigger that immune response before fire blight becomes an issue. So your first application timing at pink kind of kicks the tree, wakes the tree's immunity up. Then when you get into that critical time period where you're plugging in the antibiotics, you would wanna apply ActiGuard again with antibiotics, and then again at petal fall. And then to give that tree a boost at um, shoot, at their, during that shoot phase, that's why we would wanna put a fourth application in with the antibiotic on first cover. And that gives us a very broad, uh, broad uh, coverage on ActiGuard. I'm gonna give you four minutes here of Dr. Kerry Peters from Penn State. Steve, I'm not sure we're catching that audio. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So I'll just I'll just pause this a second. Uh, so essentially, Dr. Kerry Peter at Penn State uh, did a lot of work with ActiGuard. Um, she's stressing that you start that immune response early. If anyone wants to take uh, search YouTube, uh, YouTube. Um, and it's the uh, session five of the Cornell Fruit Conference. Uh, Dr. Carrie Peter talks about the successes and challenges and her experience with, uh, with ActiGuard and the importance is to get that signal in the plant started early. And she also talks about the, um, how, how the other SARs on the market don't have the strength uh, to trigger that plant uh, in that signal in the plant uh, like ActiGuard does. So uh, that's just a summary. So go ahead and, 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 and if you want to email me or at contact Eric, I can get you this link. But uh, Dr. Carrie Peter talks about her experience with, with ActiGuard. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about uh, is Endigo. Uh, we've had some changes uh, uh, in, in, the last, in the last few days with Endigo. Endigo ZC is our premix of Lambda Cyalphrin, a pyrethroid in thiamethoxin, which is a neonic. Um, for a lot of years, we've been using this in orchard at a rate of five to six ounces per acre, pretty much crop dependent on, on what, uh, what you're targeting, uh, in which pests you're targeting and what crop. And if you look at the label, obviously this is stone fruit, but in apples are pretty much the same, same scenario. Aphids you're controlling at five ounces to the acre, if you get into a situation where you've got apple maggot or plum curculio, we want to see you at five and a half to six ounces per acre. But on the label, you also see that's for suppression because Endigo ZC has a certain ratio of warrior and thiamethoxin. For plum curculio, we always recommend uh, boosting your neonic or the thiamethoxin rate up by adding another two ounces of Actera. So this year we launched a product called Endigo ZCX, which means extra, uh, extra warrior and extra thiamethoxin. So we've increased the lambda rate uh, from 9.48% up to 9.59, and the thiamethoxin load we've taken up to 19.2%. What does that mean as far as rates? Well, typically Endigo ZC, if we used it at a six ounce rate, it was giving us two and a half ounces of warrior and three and a half ounces of Actera. That's slightly below the rate that we like to see for plum curculio control. With Endigo ZCX, if we continue to use that six ounce rate, it's got us at that 2.6 ounce rate of Warrior 
and it's bumped us up now to 5.4 ounces of Actera, which is a robust enough rate. It's going to give us longer uh, aphid control. And honestly, it's it's going to be the new standard for rosy a a apple aphid uh, since, since Lord's Van is gone. So that's, I'm almost up to my 15 minutes. Uh, we do have the siege. I think a lot of folks have used the siege in the past, um, but I want to just pause for, for a minute if anyone has any questions. I have a question about uh, Provia versus Maravis. Yes. If we're just primarily managing for scab, a lot of us don't really aren't that concerned with powdering mildew up here. Is there an advantage to Maravis over Aprovia? If you've got Aprovia in your program, you're comfortable with it. I would say by all means continue to use Aprovia. It's it's uh, I mean both Aprovia and Miravis are are just as strong on scab as as uh, at, I mean they're about equal uh, strength on scab. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So I'll stop my screen share. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate you hopping in there and uh, last minute for us and uh, giving us some uh, product updates. And just generally speaking for the group, I know I I've been asked in the field many times by uh, a lot of different growers for that traditional kind of the nutrient uh, supplier update meetings and when that's going to come back. And that also uh, this coming year, whether it's this coming winter or uh, spring, I will do the full on supplier update points uh, rich uh, meeting for for everybody to, uh, you know, hear about what's new and the latest and greatest. So uh, thank you again, Steve, and we'll uh, kind of move along on the agenda here. Um, the next thing up, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to do a marketing effort review um, from the VTFGA before getting into to close this thing out with our uh, official VTFGA um, business meeting. Um, and just to kind of try to tell this story so that it makes sense and it's been a little challenging doing with the Zoom meetings. If everybody recalls, um, we then the last VTFGA meeting last year on Zoom, we, we talked about, you know, wrapping up our um, multi-year long grant where we had Rose as our consultant and we were writing the kind of marketing plan for the VTFGA going forward. And then what were we going to do next? And it was presented at the time that we were going to move in to a relationship with Vermont Fresh and dig in um, to kind of uh, push forward our marketing efforts as an organization. And so what I'm gonna basically try to highlight the best I can here is what we did last year um, with Vermont Fresh. And then as we move into the VTFGA meeting, we can kind of take some questions from anybody who may have one um, as to where we go from there um, and what anybody thinks about it. So let me, let me share my screen and I will quickly, yeah, let's we'll just start here. So this was the this was the the plan that we kind of laid out with Vermont Fresh as to what we were looking to do last year, uh, moving forward with this kind of new relationship and getting some of this up off the ground was um, some of the heavy left leg work that needed to be done, and then kind of maintaining it going forward should be considerably easier. Um, but our main our main goals, and I mean, you guys can read this and I'm not gonna sit here and read it to you, was to um, get our online, get our online um, social media presence uh, more active, um, which is one of our bullet points here. Try to create a, uh, an opportunity for growers to submit photos um, of different things going on in their orchards and or some marketing campaigns that we can start to collect some uh, photos for our own content library that we can then recycle and put out onto our social media. Um, and then v VFN was going to also put out um, some quarterly newsletters and promote um, apples in the fall for us. And so I, I'm going to highlight a few of these and just show you guys 
um, the different things we did. It's not all of them by any means. And hopefully I can do this appropriately here. Why don't we start with, so one of the first things that came out and most of you should have seen it. Um, and there's gonna be some overlap here and I apologize to that, but it, it is just kind of highlights the work that was done in the background. Um, VFN put out, this was their fall newsletter that came out. Um, it came out from us and it should have hit everybody's inbox, including their entire um, dig in mail directory, which was, I believe when we get to the, um, the summary page from VFN was, um, was over 8,000 people. And this was highlighting one of the ideas that they were, we did this fall, which was our photo contest, which I'll talk a little bit about more in a minute. Um, and it was also highlighting um, the profiles that were done. And I believe we had six or seven of you growers that were uh, contacted and participated in the uh, grower profiles that went on Diggins website. It went on Vermont Tourism. Um, so website, and it even made it into a few local printings, uh, one being seven days. I know it made it in down here in Addison County in the independent. And so it, it had a great, uh, it had some great reach to it. Yeah. So this, again, this is the newsletter that we put out. It was one of the member profiles. This one was on sunrise. I don't know if Barney and Chris are on, but yeah, here are the orchards that were profiled by them this past year. Um, and the links to them in the email and they did some different things on Diggins website on recipes and um, it was good. The, these came out quarterly. Most of you should have got them. I don't know that everybody opened them, but it, uh, it was well prepared, very pro professionally done. Um, and they put one out each quarter for us, which was fantastic. Um, the meet the grow profiles, which I just highlighted, went over, um, which was open to everybody. They just did the growers that responded. Um, our intention is to do them again this coming year. And for anybody who wants to be profiled and, and put out there, um, would be great. We'd welcome it. Um, this was the other one. This was a little different. Um, Dig In does this series that is not... Digging, this isn't just what they do for us. Um, the Snack is one of their uh, publications that they put out. And this one was on apples. And this is one that they put out, I believe, in the end of August, which most of you should have seen in your inboxes. Hey, no, hey er Eric, we're still seeing just your Word document. Oh, I'm sorry. Shoot. Thank you for speaking up. How do... Uh, well, that's a bummer. I wonder, oh, you got to do new share each time. I am sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Um, well, I'm not going to review that again. This was the, um, this was the newsletter. Can you guys see that now, the, the snack? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. So again, this is their, this is the again series that they do, not just on apples, uh, but they did one for us at the start of uh, the fall that was Apple focused and it highlighted, you know, just, just the season, the usual, the usual stuff as people get worked up and ready to go for the picking season. And um, it's what they put out um, for us specifically. Again, this one highlighted the meet the grower series that they did. Um, you can go to the blog and look at everybody's write up. Um, it highlighted the Apple photo contest in their newsletter, um, and then their efforts in Vermont open farm week that included some stuff from us. And then it also showed, yeah, this was some of the, uh, Instagram pictures that got put in, um, for the photo contest. So this was also a really, it, it's similar to the email that went out, but different. This is under their, uh, snack, um, series that they publish. And um, this one was for us, which was great. So the other main thing I touched on it briefly was the, um, they got our Instagram page up and going. Um, that was new for the VTFGA. We did not have an active Instagram page prior to. Um, 
Can you guys see if I switch over to this document? Or are you still looking at the snack? Does it say Vermont Apple Photo Contest? Yep, or do we I see have that. To? Okay, yep. so with, if I'm within this bubble, it stays. Okay, so um, they got our Instagram page up and running for us. Um, the other main thing that they did was that photo contest that I touched on a little bit here. Um, all the growers in the VTFGA should have gotten the hard copy, uh, one that I sent out to you for you to hang up on your orchard and the rules. Um, and then they also put it in the newsletter and the emails to get some, uh, you know, publicity out for it. And from their perspective, they run more than one contest every year. Uh, Digging is, you know, it's a bigger organization. Um, I know from their perspective, they felt that the response on year one was fantastic. They were kind of surprised at what they got for entries. Um, as, as I've said, to, as I said to Terry, their executive director, you know, apples are apples are popular. They're they're very uh, social media friendly, and people. Uh, People get excited over it. And so what Tara quickly did for me, this is a basically uh, the numbers, um, which I know the directors here have seen, but this was the uh, response and the, the numbers behind their marketing efforts as to what they um, achieved for us this year. Um, oops, and so let me see if I can go through this just quickly for the members to see. So they got 98 photos entered into our photo contest this year. Um, we were promoting the eat apple eat VT apples hashtag on Instagram and it got used 208 times uniquely. Um, I kind of touched on some of the other places. They it went into seven days. I know it went into the Addison Independent. Um, and they put out some flyers as well. Get down through this. Yeah. And the other thing that they do, you would have to click on these individually, uh, because they, they put it out in different in different areas and arenas, but this was their top 10 Apple pages during picking season that got um, great click rates. Um, they did they did a series, you know, you can read it yourself, but a blog on celebrating Apple season. Um, I know that Scott Farm seems to have made it on there twice for two of the top 10 pages here. Um, Greg Burt's grower profile was also apparently very popular and Apple Fest here in my hometown of Shoreham was a popular one and then apparently the cap at Apple Pie Fest well, up in the Greg Burt's area was uh, was popular. So these are all unique things that they did that were you know Apple related partially for us partially for their own efforts um, which is what I feel like in general made the relationship with Vermont Fresh kind of work for both of us. They, they, they partnered with us, we paid them to do um, some of these specific efforts for us, but it also validated the things that they are already involved in and made their content um, richer in my opinion. So here is some of the other numbers. This is, oh, this is our Instagram, let me do it this way. Instagram followers, we got up to, I think we're, we're over 450 now. This was back in October at the snapshot, which is pretty good for year one um, of starting it up. Here is, um, oh yeah, here's the specific numbers. So they sent out that snack um, newsletter that I put up on the screen that went out to just under 8,000 people, had an open rate of 30% uh, or just over. Which apparently is good that you know they, they do this all the time they, they were quite impressed with that um she also went and then they did a resend to the people who did not open it and had a follow-up uh open rate of 17 percent, which is great um here are some oh yeah we had 14 orchards uniquely tagged in the photo contest and hopefully your orchard was here um and if we continue this effort this coming year, we can build upon this and make it bigger. But um, great variety from across the state, really, if you look at the locations of everybody. Um, and a few on there that I'm not even sure where they're located, which is great. Um, anyway, so the that was, yeah, that just highlights that again. I already went over that. 
this was some of our entries into the photo contest that we threw on here just for you guys to see. Again, it's within the VTFGA's content library now that we can use for our own promotions, put it up on Instagram or Facebook and kind of uh, build upon it. Um, but yeah, these are, these are great here. I forget, this is, this is Scott Farm. Okay, great. Down there. And this one was from Yates. And anyway, I just wanted to show you guys, show everybody on here um, some of the entries that we had. We have the entire folder if somebody was uh, so interested into, into looking at it. Um, so anyway, in the last, I'm going to pivot away here because I know 115, we're going to uh, our other marketing effort that did not have anything to do with uh, VFN was our longstanding um, relationship with the Vermont Department of Health and their You First program. And I'm trying to find where I put that just again to keep it in everybody's mind, the certificate. Okay, let me new share. This is the uh, certificate that I know a lot of you growers saw. This is the U first ticket. And we intend to continue this with the Department of Health as long as they would like to. They purchased more this year than I believe we ever have before. Um, they're very happy with the program. Their members are very happy with it. And um, for any of you growers who are wondering about it, I know I've been asked during the fall, you can go on the Department of Health's website and read about their program and what you first represents and their uh, membership. But um, we were certainly pleased with their, with their efforts. This is the certificate out in the field. And of course the directions for those who um, ended up receiving one of how to send it back to the VTFGA and get reimbursed for the half bushel of apples that uh, their member picked up. And so any, any questions? Those were those were the majority of our marketing efforts that I kind of blew through here. But um, any questions from the membership here before we um, pivot away for a quick minute? Okay. So I'm going to unshare here for a minute, and then I believe yeah, I'm right on one fifteen. We're going to. Uh, stop for a moment and let Jake Jacobs take over. And then we're going to finish up here with some nominations and uh, our official VTFGA business meeting. Hey, Jake. Hey, how are you, Eric? Good to see I'm everybody. Good. good to see you too. Um, pretty well. I've been thinking a lot about apples and all the tree fruits because we've had such a bizarre roller coaster of winter weather. So, Hopefully people who are suffering damages have crop insurance coverage or some kind of disaster coverage. Um, I work in at UVM. I'm basically coordinating the outreach education for agricultural risk management. And that includes making sure we get out information about some of the changes to federal programs that impact producers. And I just wanted to let you know, some of you will remember a couple years ago, uh, USDA came out with some listening sessions because they were talking about making some changes to apple crop insurance. As a matter of fact, they had some meetings across the country. The biggest number of producers who participated was at the Northeastern meeting that was held in New Hampshire. About six months later, which was sometime last a year ago spring, they had some follow-up meetings for an additional comment period. And then the information all goes to whoever has to make the decisions about policy provision changes. Well, they just recently announced that RMA has extended the comment period again for Apple crop insurance. So I'm encouraging any Apple growers who have an interest, um, I'm gonna pop into the um, website, into the chat, excuse me, I'll pop in a link to the article that tells about the extended deadline for comments, and also a link to the federal register site that has the entire policy spelled out and what they're, what they're recommending for changes. And it also includes at that link, a place where you can insert your comments. 
Um, so let me start, let me pop this in. It's fairly extensive. There are two links here. One is going to take you to a news release about the extended comment period. The second one is actually the Federal Register, where you can read the policy changes that they're proposing and insert your comments. And I would encourage you to get this word out to growers that you know, because it's going to have an impact. There will be no changes for the 22 growing season and 2023 will likely not see any changes. Uh, my understanding from RMA is that any changes that they implement will happen after the next enrollment period. So that means they would take effect in 2024. But sometimes the government surprises us. So I would just say, if you have ideas, if you have some thoughts and perspective, please submit your comments and there are the links. I will also say the Federal Register article is quite lengthy and I'm gonna insert my, um, my email address. And if you would like, I have a version of that same Federal Register document that's been marked up and highlighted with some of the key points that they're making about changes. So if you email me, I will be happy to send that to you, but we're not posting it on the website. Somebody, a colleague in RMA was kindly went through it and said, instead of reading all bazillion pages, you know, here are the, some of the high points. So that's kind of what's brewing in um, Apple insurance at this point. We don't, I don't know, I'm not really familiar enough to know how that's gonna impact um, peaches and pears, if there are gonna be some across the board changes, but this is one that I would encourage you to at least look into, know what they're proposing and have your opportunity to make um, some comments and have some input. If there are any other questions, I'm happy and open to answer them or at least take your information and send it on to somebody who can answer it. Well, as always, thank you, Jake. Thank you. Um, and so I, I think without further ado, we'll quickly go through our VTFGA business meeting with those who are here. I have, uh, I've been asked to moderate here for the board. Um, I am not technically a voting member anymore, um, but I will call this meeting to order for our secretary at 1.20 p.m. And um, all right, let me share my screen a little more effectively this time. Let me, uh, no, that's not useful. Let's just put that up. Okay. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is um, we can quickly review the minutes from last year's um, Tree Fruit Growers meeting, annual meeting. Um, I am certainly not going to read this to everybody, but it should have been emailed out. And any questions that anybody might have on the minutes from last year's meeting, uh, feel free to pop in now and or I will take a motion to accept minutes from our wonderful secretary, Mr. Tom Smith, as written. Which can be any of you, it doesn't have to be the board, it can be any of the members um, who are on the call. Which it can be done through chat or just unmuting yourself and making a motion to accept the meeting, the minutes as written. Yeah, here's the other non-voting member here that wants to uh, chime in so we can think about how to best manage votes here. Uh, I think unless there's some kind of contested vote, we should just just do things in the chat. Uh, if there's a contested vote, I can make a poll that we can do a sure. formal vote, um, but we won't do that unless we have to. So just say your eyes and nays in the chat and that'll be good. Sure. That'll work. Yeah, let's do it that way. Um, so Mariah has made a uh, motion to accept the minutes as written. Can't I get a second? Jessica Yates has seconded the motion to accept the minutes as written. Um, and so we will open it up for discussion. If anybody has any uh, comments on the minutes from last year, 
feel free to unmute. Um, otherwise, we can vote to accept them with a yay in the chat from anybody and everybody or a nay. I don't see any discussion. So all those in favor say yes or yay in the chat. And once we have a majority, we will move on to um, the uh, treasurer's report. We got one, two, three, four, five. That should be plenty enough to accept the minutes as written. Okay, so Pat, uh, moving along, I'm going to, okay, I can do this. I need to do a new share. Um, Mark, I don't know if you are on at the moment. I think you were earlier, maybe you still are now. Um, you can feel free to hop in or I can quickly review this. Mark doesn't seem to be on. Okay, I didn't, I didn't think so. I know he was for a minute earlier. So um, the treasurer's report, which I believe everybody can see, um, is that correct? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Um, the treasurer's report from this past year is, is pretty simple. We basically ended with the same amount of money that we, we started with. So we were only, um, we were down $714 from our efforts. Um, and the reason I wanted to do the marketing update, even though it was a bit clunky, was to, sh we, we, it took a lot more effort to get our relationship with VFN up and running and effort and also equals money. Um, but in the end, we were only, we, we basically netted ourselves. We're sitting at about the same amount that we were last year, which is a great position for the BTFGA to be in. Um, it means we can continue our marketing efforts. We can continue um, the things that we're involved in and we're not, um, we're not going underwater. So um, here's a breakdown. Membership dues brought in, um, vendor fees, and then the pass on from those of you um, who decided to give money to UVM Research or US Apple, those numbers are listed here. Um, last year's U First coupons that I mentioned um, in the marketing highlight of what we brought in from the state. And then the payouts for those should be down here, which they are. We paid back out $1,469. Um, here is our Vermont Fresh bill um, and our membership in Dig In, and then our other various expenses. So we, we basically, we're sitting at about the same cash position that we were the previous year. Um, with that said, I will take a motion to accept the treasurer's report as written from somebody. As Stephanie has made a motion to accept. Can I get a second? A second from Mr. Casey Darrell, thank you. Um, open to discussion for anybody who has a comment on the treasurer's report. Uh, hearing none, I will uh, open it up to the floor here for all those in favor, please say aye in the chat. And once we get enough to have a majority, we will uh, move on. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we are, I'm gonna say that we are, we are well above a majority with the voting members. Okay, um, old business was kind of talked about with our, you know, this was the first year with our uh, relationship with VFN last year. And then moving forward here, our, our intention and our plan is um, to continue. And we're still working on that with VFN as to what that's gonna look like um, in terms of what we're gonna move forward with. But our intention as a board is to uh, continue to pursue our marketing relationship with them. Um, and I will just open it up here to any 
comments that anybody might have generally about that, um, the things we did last year, the things moving forward, if I, you want me to speak on it uh, further. Um, otherwise, I will, I will leave it at that and we'll get into voting in new, new members. Okay, with typical fashion, with the, whether it be in Zoom or in person, the uh, quiet in the audience for open discussion, but that's okay. Um, I think I just unshared. Just killed your share. That's good. Get rid of it. There you go. Um, yeah. Okay, so the the first thing we're, I think we can do this as a well, no, let's let's do it. We're gonna do this separately. So um, the slate of officers here, we have. Uh, Jim Bove, Mark Boyer, and Tom Smith all agreeing to continue in their uh, executive positions here. Um, I will take a moment if there's anybody from the floor who would like to nominate themselves or somebody else into the position of treasurer, secretary, or president, feel free. Otherwise, we can use the chat to renominate those three fine individuals to their um, positions for another term. Okay, hearing no nominations from the floor. Uh, can I get a motion to accept the three? Casey makes a motion, can I get a second? Mariah seconds. Um, all those in favor, please say aye in the chat for our three executives. And that should technically do it. Um, and in terms of directors, we, Miss Mariah Coles has agreed to another three year term uh, for her seat. And I would take a motion to except Mariah continuing on her position from any voting member would be fine. Motion to accept from Miss Jessica Yates. Second from Stephanie Lowe. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Okay, that should do it. Um, and then we have one open seat and I, my understanding is that we would need a voting member to nominate. Um, and if Connor, you are on the call still, if you, uh, if we get a nomination for Connor, we can, if you want to give a short bio or say hi to everybody, we would, uh, certainly entertain that. Sounds good. Thanks, Eric. I hope you can all hear me. Um, yeah. So uh, I wanted to first thank uh, Stephanie and Jim and uh, Casey and Devin for all telling me about this. This is uh, quite an opportunity and, and quite an organization you all have here. Um, I'm the owner and founder of Mountain Max Cider Company. And a little bit of my history is uh, I've been in construction management as a project manager for about 10 years. And before that, I grew up in southern New Hampshire. Uh, both of my parents are foresters, uh, arborists and basically grew up learning from them about trees and the forest and everything. And I really wanted to get back to it. So uh, that's what I've started, um, started doing and uh, spent a lot of time working with the, uh, the Thompson School down at UNH uh, as a younger kid um, and then working in um, both vineyards and orchards around Southern New Hampshire. So like uh, Leewood Orchards was part of UNH there and uh, also Wellington's and Demerit Hill. Um, now I'm moving into uh, the Middlebury area and taking over Stan Pratt's Orchard, Happy Valley. Uh, that's uh, in the progress or in progress right now. And um, yeah, it's really uh, shoring up the market for apples for us, just making sure that we have apples and we have a good market for our cider that, um, that we're putting out. So uh, we came on the market back in, uh, in uh, June of 2021. So we haven't even been on the market a year. And uh, I think we've already worked with a number of you folks uh, around the state and they've helped me getting apples um, as we've grown uh, tremendously in this past year. 
and uh, needed to supplement our apple supply with apples from all of your orchards. So thank you very much for all your help on that. Uh, but yeah, that's about uh, that's about wrapping it up for me on on that. But yeah, it'd be great to be part of your organization. I think it's a, a good uh, a good thing you've got going here. Thanks, Connor. And I see the uh, in the chat here we have had a motion to nominate Connor McManus to the VTFGA director's position, and we have a second from Mr. Casey Darrow. Um, any discussion from the group? And if not, we can go ahead and uh, vote. And those, all those in favor, please go ahead and say aye in the chat box and we'll make this official. And I appreciate all those who have been taking part in the voting on the chat box that is, has seemed to have worked here. So welcome to the board, Connor, and uh, you're, you're officially you. in, so. Um, Thank you. Good. <laughs> with that, does I'll just I think we can we're only three minutes over, so that's pretty good, considering what it usually happens in the uh, in person meetings here. Anybody, uh, any last comments for anybody on the board, different growers while we're here? Um, if not, we can we can wrap this up. Just one uh, quick comment: our board meetings are open to the public and to members. If you're at all interested, but weren't quite ready to be an official board member, you know, feel free to reach out or to participate or uh, in, in meetings and in the direction of the organization. We're looking for people to get involved. So uh, consider it. Yeah, you know, going forward, I don't know that we're ever going to get rid of Zoom, but, you know, we could always do a hybrid of you know, when we do re re resume normal operations, we used to meet a couple times a year in the Rutland uh, USDA office. Although some of our directors, I don't even think have experienced that. It just has been two years at this, but um, there's no reason we couldn't do a hybrid where Zoom is still up for those who would like to look at, you know, do the in-person and have the Zoom uh, for even members who want to hop on because um, some of our, and I'm honest, I know a few of them are, are on here today, but some of our best comments and or directional changes of the board came from some of the growers who were not part of it. It's just like, hey, you know, you got a, you got a real blank spot here and uh, you should address this. And so we, we do appreciate uh, comments out of the field um, for those who are not directly part of the board. So um, please look for those emails, feel free to attend. And um, hopefully this is the last fully uh, Zoom meeting that we have. Uh, with that, I think we can close it out unless Terry, you had any last words of wisdom and or comments. Well, I was just going to mention that that it, you traditionally, uh, this meeting is a little bit later than normal, but traditionally the next board meeting would be in April. Um, right. So I assume we'll probably stick to somewhere around there. So um, folks who might be interested in attending virtually, hell, maybe we'll get together and actually see each other's faces. I don't right. know. We'll, we'll schedule that, but uh, that's that's typically when when we'll start to see things. So, Connor, we'll we'll try and catch up to you by then, and and to everyone else, uh, happy spring! It's right around the corner. Ready or not. All right, guys, let's close the meeting out. One thirty-six, Mister Secretary, would be officially the time. Uh, good to see everybody, um, and until next time. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Bye.